right, you may be seated. May be seated. The title of today's sermon is is titled "Keep Proud Moments from Becoming Pride Moments." Keep proud moments from becoming pride moments. So last week, if you were here, last week the title of the sermon was "Your Turn," where I flipped it on everybody to where it's not that you come to church to watch ministry happen. It's not that you come to church to you know, to see an event or get an emotional feeling. Uh, Emotions are great, but technically, biblically, the church is made so that the ministers of the church are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, are to help, are to encourage, are to guide. You know, that's what the job of a minister at a church is for or anybody who's in leadership. Uh, For the New Mountain Church, we have two simple pillars that we stand on. Uh, the one is that we're deep in God's word. We, we go through a lot of God's word. Everything that we do is about God's word. We believe that the Holy Spirit moves through God's word, and we believe that God's word is powerful. So we, we have a big emphasis on knowing the Bible, preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, all that, okay? That's the first pillar. The second pillar is community. It means you know, whether it's outside these walls or inside these walls, it's discipleship, it's fellowship. That's the reason why, and I've, I fought tooth and nail for this, everybody. That's the reason why we have food after the services. It's because food amplifies fellowship. Food brings f- people together, you know, and, and, and it's a big deal. And so this is, those are those two pillars. We're deep in people's lives and community and counseling and, and, and encouraging and discipleship. And we're really deep in the Bible as well. So that's what we stand on is that. And I believe that that is what brings uh, change in people's lives. So last week was your turn. How are you walking out into ministry and doing something How are you taking hold of something or maybe starting to serve at the church in whatever area? There's like 15 different different areas that you could choose to serve in. So how are you doing it if it's your turn, you know? If you don't know how to start serving, ask anybody that's serving, how can I start serving? And actually, Amy, by the way, my wife, I know she's my wife, so I have to say this, but I really mean it. She is pretty much the smartest person I've ever met in my life. Like she has like these badges that people have. Do you guys have badges on back there? Do you have a badge on? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, some people are supposed to have badges on. Oh, Barb's got a badge right there. Yeah. Uh, on the back of the badge is a is a QR code. So if you you know want to know how how can I start serving, find somebody with a badge and say you know bring out your phone and that clicks you right in to be able to sign up to serve and get all the information you need to start serving. Uh, again, I mean. Whatever it is that you feel like doing, just do it for the glory of God. This is your turn. It's not a show that we come to watch. This is not a movie theater, okay? This is not some play that I'm putting on, although Dan is a very good actor. But this is the church. This is the church. So as those 72 went out, they had no bag, no wallet. They didn't have nothing. They were super afraid. Especially, and Jesus even made it more scary by saying, I'm sending you out as lambs amongst the wolves. And I'm sure the disciples were like, what do you mean? Like, oh, this is crazy. But yet they went out just as the 12 did a, a few chapters back. They went out and they come back. And they come back with joy. It says in Luke 10, 17, they had joy. And they're, they're excited and they say, not only did we preach, not only did we, did we help people, but we, even the demons were subject to us in your name. They were super excited. They were super happy. And you know what? C.H. Spurgeon, I, I quote him all the time. He's one of the greatest expositors, uh, expositors of scripture that I know about. Uh, he says, not one of the lambs had been eaten by wolves. They all came back. You know, they might have been afraid. They might have been kind of, you know, on guard or nervous about going out into the field, going out into the lands and the villages, but yet they went and they all came back. Some of us are like, oh, if I start doing something, uh, you know, everything's going to fall apart. No, it will not. It won't fall apart because the Lord's in it with you. The Lord's in it with you. But the main thing to look at about what the 72 said was they said that demons were subject to us 
in your name. Remember, we looked at that a few weeks back. That that is the hinge point. That is the 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 what we should emphasize. Or if you got highlighters, I don't know. Some Christians have like five different highlighters in their pocket, and they can highlight things. Well, highlight that, or underline it, or whatever. Because in your name is very very important. Because if it was not in Jesus's name, not one of those demons would have gave a care. But because it was in Jesus' name, that's where the power was. But they came back. They were. They were flipping out. They were happy. They were excited. They had joy. They had joy. Now, for those of you that you've heard me say this a few times, what does joy mean? Jesus, others, and yourself. You're really close, though. You're really close. Jesus, others, and yourself. That is the order to put the importance in your life. Jesus, others, and yourself. Uh, not the other way around, not yodge. We don't need any yodge going on. That's yourself, others, and then, oh, Jesus, maybe for one hour on Sunday. No, 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 we don't need that. We need joy, and these disciples had joy. But yet, Jesus saw something, though. Jesus, he didn't want to stifle their excitement, but yet, he saw something that could be rising up within them, and it was pride, The P word, pride. And so this is what it says, Luke 10, 18 to 20. And he said to them, that's Jesus saying to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What he's telling them is, is you've done some awesome stuff. You've done some great things. But watch out for pride. Watch out for arrogance in it. Watch out for the big head, right? The inflated ego. Watch out, he says. Watch out. Now, for those of you who are Bible nerds, what is Satan going to be judged for mainly in the end? Pride. You didn't even let me finish. You just jumped out like pride. Yes, yes. Pride, right? We, we got a picture. We got a picture. Now, does this look familiar? Is who we think about? We think about the devil. We think about this guy, right? Why is he wearing a diaper, by the way? I don't even know why he's wearing a diaper. Yeah, because he's a big turd. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're socking it to him today. That's good. Yeah, this is what we think about when we think about Satan. We think about this, this character, right? The pitchfork, right? What else? The horns, the... Uh, or what, or what about the cape? You know, sometimes we see, see Satan in a cape, right? Or with a, what's that one goatee called? The, the really pointed one. I guess it's called a pointed goatee. Okay. Well, we see, we see him like that, right? You ever wondered why Satan looks like that in comics or in, you know, movies or cartoons or pictures or whatever? You ever wonder why he looks like that? Because the Bible doesn't say he looks like that. Ever wonder why? It's actually a, a, an old thing that happened with the Puritans way back in the day. Is they had this thing, some a, a small group of Puritans, Christians back in the day, they had this thing where they wanted to have this event where they made fun of Satan. They like, you know, poked it to him. You know, they, they tried to defame him. They tried to mock him. And I, I mean, I, what, what they were doing, I, I could kind of see, I don't think we need to go that far with things, but... But they wanted to paint, G, uh, paint Satan as being the goofiest, dumbest looking character. And so they made all these pictures of Satan. And so they, they have him with horns and red makeup. And they have him with a pitchfork and, and stuff like that. Well, this is where things get rough if you don't teach your kids why you do certain things. Because as the as those Puritans, you know, grew old and passed away, the, the next generation kind of knew what those pictures represented. But then as they grew old and passed away, the grandchildren had no idea why Satan looked like that. And they thought that that's what Satan really looked like. And so that's stuck with our culture all through these years till now, where when you go out on the street and you ask the random Joe Schmo, he will, and you say, what does Satan look like? Oh, pitchfork. Uh, horns, red, right? 
This is what they would say. But this is all because of people trying to make fun of Satan and it becoming something that now our culture thinks is how people or Christians thought Satan looked like. He did not look like this in the Bible at all. Do you know in the Bible, Satan's actually painted as the most beautiful creature that God crea- ever created? If we saw him on the street, well, we probably wouldn't think he, looked, he was Satan. Probably think he was a supermodel or something. Do they have male supermodels? I think they do, don't they? I don't ever look at that kind of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to ask any of you women if, you, if you've seen that. But no. Uh, we, we would think that he was just a, a really handsome, good-looking person because in, in the Bible, he's painted as being somebody who is, is very, very uh, shiny, very, very glorious-looking. Supposedly, he was maybe even the head cherub. Now, if you think about the Old Testament and you think about the Ark of the Covenant where God would be in the Old Testament, there was two cherubs hanging over it. And what was, what was their wings doing for you Bible nerds? What was the wings of the cherubs on top of the ark doing? Covering, right? That's, the, that's, the, that's a cherub's job, to guard, to protect, to cover. And so Satan was technically the head cherub, the worship leader of heaven, if, if, if you might say, because it talks about in some scripture that he even had uh, symbols and, and horns inside of his body. He was like a moving, beautiful, musical instrument. He's known even if you were to take the name Lucifer, the, Lu- the name Lucifer means uh, morning star. And so that's why for me, when I look on TBN and I see Daystar, the Daystar network, I'm like, Ooh, whoa, not sure what's going on there. That's kind of weird. Uh, but Satan's known as, as something like a bright star, a glorious star. But we know that's not at all who he is. He's not the red, you know, pitchfork holding, horn wielding uh, cartoon character that those people long ago were trying to make fun of. It's crazy how things change over time and how, how people lose hold or lose grasp of what the older generations were trying to do. I mean, think about this. We all know this. Who's afraid of clowns? Yeah, I, you know, I, you, you know, who's seen the movie It, right? You know, like, eh, no more clowns. Clowns, no way. But you realize that there was a time where people liked clowns. And it was, it was, you know, they would look at clowns and, and see joy and see happiness and kids, you know, having good times and all that. But today in our culture, it's changed, right? So I would, I would like for us to really get a grasp of who, of who Satan really is. Because for any general, any uh, military-minded person, if you know your enemy, you can fight him better, right? That's just logic. If you know your enemy, you can fight him better. So what is happening here? is Jesus is saying, I mean, you, you, you cast these, these demons out, that's awesome, that's great, that's really grand, but, but I've seen Satan fall like lightning. I've seen the pride in the, the arrogance of, of the greatest creature that God created falling and, and, and coming and, and falling to earth. What's crazy is that you don't realize that this verse that we're looking at today, this verse was actually in the news a few years ago. Because there was a rapper that thought it would be a great idea to uh, somehow make these shoes that were $1,000, by the way. And he made these shoes. This rapper is, uh, you know, totally, uh, um, he's totally in his sin and he's loving his sin. And, and I, I believe that even maybe darkness is, is, is making him to, to do this. But, but he has these shoes that he made that had... Uh, 666 on it, a pentagram on it, uh, and, and on the sole of the shoe or on the heel of the shoe, he put this verse, Luke 10, 18. And he was trying to say, like, uh, you know, trying to, you know, bring glory to Satan's name with these shoes that were $1,000, by the way. I can't imagine how anybody could do that. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, this the shoe being so horrible. But yet he put that verse on there. What's funny is that he's trying to bring glory to Satan, but that verse is actually doing the opposite. It's the fact that God the Father has cast Satan out of heaven. 
Jesus has given those disciples that were going out into the land authority, resources, protection. But for a time, scripturally, Satan actually had access to God in heaven. I know that that seems weird. That seems, what What are you talking about? Well, let's look at this. We're going to go through some pretty big portions of scripture, so try to keep up with me. They're going to be on the screen. You don't have to turn to all these, but but this one is Job 1, 8 through 12. I want to try to give you the, the uh, understanding of, of what was going on. Uh, it says this, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This is an interaction happening between Satan and God. This is an interaction in heaven. This is, this is an interaction in what uh, some theologians call the, the, the divine council, the heavenly host, uh, the area where there's the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and the angels. And, he, and we know that in Scripture there's many different types of angels, seraphim, cherubim. Uh, and we know that there's many different types of darkness as well. Uh, there's there's the uh, the wicked angels that are under the river Euphrates. There's uh, the uh, great destroyer angel that gets let out and goes flying over the people of Egypt. Uh, there's many different spiritual beings. And so for a time, Satan was even there with God. This is what it says in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. This is, this is, let me set this up first. This passage in Ezekiel is, is pointed at the king of Tyre, a wicked king, a king that was, that was totally pagan, uh, totally brutal, totally just wrapped up in, in sin and idolatry. But yet the prophet Ezekiel uses him or, or, or talks about the king of Tyre. But then, and this is something that I've definitely come to understand, Behind the king of Tyre is the puppeteer pulling strings. And I think that happens with many of the people that we see in our, in our culture today that are just utterly wicked. I mean, yeah, they're sinners. Yeah, they're, they're unregenerate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But behind them is the puppeteer pulling the strings. Uh, and, and so this is what the prophet Ezekiel, he first starts talking to the king of Tyre, but then he flips it to talk to the puppeteer. This is what he says, Ezekiel 28, 14 to 16. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were in the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So this is a serious prophecy that Ezekiel is given. He's given about Satan. But you might want to ask this question. This is a, one of the most important questions, and it's actually one of the most uh, often given questions, is why on earth would God allow Satan to do his work? Why? Why not just destroy him? Why not just like, you know, Star Trek, you know, zap him and turn him into plasma? I mean, why, God, why allow Satan to work? This is a serious question. It's, this is a question that for, for any minister, we need not to jump quick into, oh, well, because of God's sovereignty and his glory. Because people in church or in the world are hurting because of pain and suffering caused by either their sin, someone else's sin, 
or darkness. And we need to take a moment and try to explain and, t- and try to um, you know, encourage and, and give people peace in the fact that God is allowing stuff to happen, but yet he's doing it all for a reason and a purpose. There's many people who say that if there was uh, no evil in the world ever, if there was no problems in the world ever, no sorrow ever, what would happen is no growth, no overcoming, no strengthening, no persevering. And what would happen is a vanilla, regular, beige type of a a life to where there is no growth, there is no persevering, there is no training for eternity. But yet for us as Christians, anything that happens in life, it's all for a reason that God is either using to bring judgment on darkness or to bring strength to the Christian. Think about it like this. Think about it like this. And and, and this happened actually a few years ago. But in Yuma, there was a pigeon problem. Does anybody know that there's a pigeon problem in Yuma? I think think we all know that. Yeah, we all know that. Well, um, whoever was the authority, uh, you know, the the people in charge, uh, they actually bought quite a few number of owls and hawks. And they released them down in downtown Yuma. Like I remember hearing about it. They released these owls and hawks. What do owls and hawks do? Yeah, they eat meat. (laughs) They kill. They hunt. But it was for the good of the Yuba people, right? Think about these owls, right? They can turn their head like 360 degrees. They have large claws and beak, right? They go, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> or, or hawks, you know, they can dive bomb and they just can rip flesh off of these birds, right? That's pretty violent. It's pretty painful. But it's for our good, right? Or think about hunting. I've heard, I'm not a hunter at all, but I've heard this before, that if there was no deer hunting, the deer population would grow into a, a, a level to where there would be disease and, and, and famine within the deer community, I, I'm, I'm thinking. Well, if that's the case, then hunting actually does good. And so for us, we've got to understand that there's sometimes that, that problems that happen in life that God lets happen is for our good. It's for our strength. We grow from it. We have soft hearts because of it. I mean, I don't know how many people have experienced a hard thing in their life. Maybe family issues, maybe sexual abuse, maybe the loss of a loved one. And because of that, they've actually gained a heart for other people that have those same things happening to them. I don't know how many times this happens to us. If we have issues in life, they're either to make us better or to make somebody else better, to make us stronger, to make somebody else stronger. And no matter what, God is justice. No evil goes unpunished. But at the same time, God has his plan and his purpose. And so we see from that Ezekiel text that Satan, as he was able to hang out in heaven, so to speak, maybe in, 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 in the divine council, the heavenly host, as he was able to just hang out for a while, we see here in Ezekiel that there's that moment where because of his pride, he's cast down, cast down to earth. And this is what it says in the next part, Revelation 12, 7-9. It says, Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So what we see here is we see a few different falls that happen to Satan. And thank God for that. First, we see from Ezekiel that he's fallen from prominence to profane. And now we see in Revelation that he's fallen to the earth. But that doesn't end there. He's then fallen from earth 
into the bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Let's look at it. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Then, this is John the Apostle having this vision, seeing uh, or, or, or talking or having Jesus' revelation. Uh, he says this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. Isn't that just cool? Isn't that just awesome to think about? I would like to see this great chain. Okay, anyway. Verse 2 says, And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. And for those of you that, know, that want to know why he must be released, you need to come to the Revelation Bible study on Wednesday nights. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, this ancient serpent, right? Who, who did we see in the garden? Okay, okay, yeah. So he was now fallen from earth into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. You realize what a bottomless pit is? A pit with no bottom. So what does that mean? You keep falling. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I've seen those, you know, those chambers that some people can pay money and go into where you like... There's air coming up and you're able to float, right? You're, you feel like you're like just floating in midair. But can you imagine this falling forever or for, for right here, a thousand years? But that's not even the last fall of Satan. Have anybody in this room ever heard that term? Out of the frying pan into the... Okay, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Revelation 20:10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's his end. He comes to, uh, this is what he was created for. This is what hell was created for, sorry. Uh, for the devil and his demons, the false prophet, all of them to be in the lake of fire. And so anybody who's, following after this devil or, or giving glory to this devil or uh, letting this devil run their lives. This is the destination for them as well. This is why it's so important for us to go out like those 72 did and to meet people and reach people and talk to people about Jesus because there's so many people that we know in our families, in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools that are, that are following right in line with the Prince of Darkness. And if we don't have joy in reaching out into our communities, reaching out to our people, or even serving at church and, and making it to where this is an area, this is a place where people can really know God. If we don't do that, then people are just going down. People are just going down. This is what it says from a quote from C.H. Spurgeon again. He says, where the gospel is preached with divine power, Satan comes down from his throne in the human hearts and human minds as rapidly as the lightning flash falls from heaven. And when we see his kingdom shaken, then like Jesus, we rejoice in the spirit. Jesus was happy. Jesus was ecstatic about the success of his disciples. Did you know that Jesus is smiling when he sees you walk the Christian life? When he sees you interact with people or serve at church or talk to your neighbor, when he sees you live the life of Jesus, did you know that Jesus is smiling on that? He's rejoicing about that. Uh, there's so many things that happen when we actually walk this walk as a Christian and not just say that we're a Christian or mark on a paper that we're a Christian, but we actually live the life of a Christian. This is what happens is, is, is things are changed all around us Things are completely changed, but yet we have to watch out for that P word. Because if, like Billy says, if we you know, come alongside somebody and, and, and in our serving, uh, they are encouraged or, or able to overcome problems, what can pop up is, hey, that was kind of cool. I was able to help somebody. I was able to change somebody. And then it starts becoming like, well, I must be pretty cool then, you know? And things start to change inside here and it starts to be like, well, me and I and myself. And things start to get out of whack, big time. 
Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, a theologian from back in the 1920s, he said this, in the most holy work, there always lurks this danger of the glorification of the self-life. Even if you're doing the best things, even if you're ministering, even if you're caring for the sick, even if you're out evangelizing people on the street, whatever you're doing, if you're in a nursing home ministering, uh, what can happen is that lurking danger, which is that P word, pride. It could pop up. That's why we always got to be putting pride to death. We always got to be putting down ourselves and picking up our cross. But Jesus says in that, he says, I've given you the power. I've given you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions. I've, been, I've given you the ability, he's saying. But here's a great example of somebody taking what Scripture's saying and making it into pride about themselves. And I don't know if you've met any people like this before, but I got a picture of the, the Appalachian Holiness Movement guys. We might know them as snake handlers. Ever seen people like that or know people like that? Uh, there's a, there's a, you know, a small offshoot of the Methodist church that has become what's, what's known as the holiness movement, which means you, know, uh, you can work yourself into being perfect like Jesus was. And that's definitely not scriptural. But they, but they also think or thought or even maybe still do think uh, that what Jesus is saying is that, oh, I've given you power. I've given you power to overcome serpents and snakes and scorpions and all sorts of stuff. Tarantulas maybe even. I don't know. They're just kind of creepy. They got hair on their legs. Anyways. But so what does these Christians do and say, okay, so that means that I can handle them. I can pick them up. I can just hang them in the air and I can do all these things. And a bunch of these guys have get, gotten bitten and even died. I, I happen to notice that that one guy is missing an arm. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know, you know, it could be in his pocket maybe, but it looks like it's, uh... anyways, uh, but why would you have to tempt God if it wasn't for pride, if it wasn't for arrogance? You know, they get this kind of idea from this text right here, but then they also get it from the longer ending of Mark. So I want you to go actually to the book of Mark in the 16th chapter. I want to do a little test out here and see. In, in uh, theology, there's something called textual criticism, and it's not criticism. It's kind of like a like textual understandings or textual, um, uh, you know, wisdom and knowing the ancient manuscripts. So I said this last week, but for Christians, there's about five thousand pretty much complete ancient papyrus manuscripts of the Bible. Okay. Crazy number compared to any other ancient work of all mankind. Uh, the, the only reason we know about uh, Julius Caesar, you know, the Gallic Wars, there's like 15 ancient manuscripts. Homer's Iliad, Iliad there's like 10 ancient manuscripts. Uh, the work of Jesus Christ, uh, 5,000. But now we got to look at something, though. In these manuscripts, there's some that are, that are more complete than others, and there's some ancient manuscripts that are older than others, right? This is, this is how Christianity spread, is that people from churches would travel to different towns, and they would copy down books of the Bible, and this happened just hundreds and thousands of times all throughout the Middle East until God's word just flourished and, and just moved throughout all of the land and into different towns, different villages, across seas even. And so for now, when we look back at all these ancient manuscripts, we see that there's some parts that maybe go longer than other parts, or some parts are missing certain parts. And so in our scriptures, there's a few different parts in our Bibles where, and I, I would state it this way, where some of the text is questionable to whether it's God's word. I would rather err on the side of, you know, God has chosen to preserve it in our modern translations, so let's just hang on to it, okay? But there's some people that, that when they get to certain sections of scripture, they do not preach it because there's a chance that it's not God's word, that it was added in later. Uh, one of the most famous sections of scripture, this is, I know this is kind of in-depth, you know, 
theological stuff, but hey, you guys are smart. I don't think you're stupid. So I think you should, should, you should be able to catch what I'm throwing out, okay? In the Bible, there is one part that is very loved and cherished called the woman caught in adultery. Have we read that before? Yeah? Uh, the pericope adultery is what it's called in, in, in Latin, but it's, it's maybe not in God's word really. Because keep in mind, I've got the ESV translation. Who else got a different translation than me? What, what's yours, Edie? NIV? Anybody else have anything? New King James? What'd you got? Uh, oh, what do you got, Randy? New King James? Yeah. So what we all have is translations of God's word. We got to keep that in mind, that when God had given his word, it was in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, Aramaic and Greek. That was the languages that God provided for the church his word now we have translations that pull from all these different manuscripts and some translations pull from different manuscripts and that's why you have different translations so everybody got to mark 16 okay so mark 16 most likely will stop at verse 8 but does anybody have it where it goes past 8 Past verse 8. So what does yours go to? What verse? Um, Goes all the way to 20. Anybody else? What what do you got, JR? Um, 20? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a a lot of them go to 20. There's a chance that that is actually added on hundreds of years after the ancient manuscripts. There's a chance of that. Now, this is where it comes into... I think the Holy Spirit just needs to lead us into, you know, do we hold to it or do we not? You know, this is where it kind of leads us into. Because some scholars think that it ends at 8. It ends at 8. But let's look at Mark 16, 18, which is kind of a questionable one. It says this, They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So, it, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not so sure. Because Jesus is saying, I'm giving, you a, a, I'm giving you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Meaning, I get, I'm giving you power to go wherever you need to go. I don't know if Jesus would say, would say, hey, just randomly pick up that rattler right there. I don't know. I don't know if that's what Jesus was, would be saying. But this section right here, the long, it's called the longer ending of Mark is one of those texts that people get that idea from handling about handling snakes i don't think we need to handle snakes i don't think we need to tempt god because what comes from tempting pride Uh, or pride actually kind of brings temptation to where we we think that we could tempt god or tempt the goodness of god or tempt the forgiveness of god or or even tempt the judgment of god i pray to God that we don't do that. And, and I pray to God that we don't focus deeply on our, our, our abilities or our ministries, but I pray that like Jesus said, we would focus on this, that our names are written in heaven. I mean, think about this. Uh, how, how often do you think about what's going on uh, and what you're doing and what, you, what you're reading and, and how much you're going to church or how much you're, you're ministering, but you, you forget about just that simple fact that you have been saved for eternity. You were once going to hell, and because of Jesus Christ, you're not now. Because of Jesus Christ, you have eternal life with him. Why does that just seem to leave us and and, and fly out of our head, and we don't even think about it? We live our life hardly even remembering that we've been saved, that we have new life, a new purpose, that we have a, a new heart, that even our, our thinking changes. But we don't think about that. The greater miracle that happened was not that they kicked out those demons. It was that their names are written in heaven. I mean, how often do you think about this? The next part, uh, next part Luke 10, 21, this is where Jesus goes into saying, I thank you, Father. So immediately after the good news about the disciples doing all this great work. Jesus wants them to be careful about pride, but then he goes right to prayer, thanking God the Father. 
The ancient Greek says that he was thrilled with joy. That's what it actually meant. He was thrilled with joy. And it wasn't about the fact that his disciples were just great, awesome dudes with perfect ability to do all these miraculous things. It was just about that they trusted in Jesus, like as a little child, like as a, a, a person that is, that, that is totally faithful and trusting in the leader, which was Jesus. I mean, 1 Corinthians says it, 27 through 29. It says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. No human being might boast. It is not your own power. It is Jesus' power, the Spirit's power in us. This is the great news is that those disciples went out and they didn't have nothing with them and, and they were going out amongst wolves and they came back filled with joy because they had power. They weren't able to do it on their own accord, but yet Jesus gave them power to do it. See, this is why I don't understand the church today. I don't get it. I didn't grow up in church, by the way. I went to Roman Catholic Church when I was a kid on Easter and, and Christmas. That was it. I, I didn't grow up in church. And, and so now when I'm reading the Bible and I'm looking at our church, I'm thinking, what in the world? What is going on? I, don't, I really don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't understand what, what makes us take a backseat approach to ministry or to life as a Christian. I don't get it. I, I don't understand. I mean, I, I'm hoping people are reading the same Bible I'm reading. I'm hoping people are hearing Jesus' words that he, he's given, uh, that, that we're supposed to actually be active in ministry. Uh, I know that word just seems so big and grand, like how can I possibly do any of that? The good news is that you can't do any of it. The better news is that God's going to do it through you. But are you going to take the step? Are you going to start walking it out? And many of you have taken, uh, you know, taken hold of it and jumped into ministry and really started to move in it. But some are still playing the, the, the backseat bench warming, uh, you know, position. I hope not. I hope that would change. I hope that would change. You know, uh, there was a guy, F.B. Meyer, old theologian. I show a lot of these guys, so I just hope that you gain from them what I gain from them, their, their wisdom. F.B. Meyer said this, There is no victory won anywhere by any lonely disciple that does not react on the entire battlefield. I don't know how many people say, Oh, I'm just a greeter. Oh, I just work with the kids. No, you don't. You actually do battle. And it's a battle that is felt on the battlefield of the war. Jesus says, I thank you, Father. Matthew 28 says that all authority in heaven has been given to Jesus. And if we take that idea and, and we see that Jesus says that nobody can know him except for the Father, and nobody can know the Father except for the Son, and nobody can know the Father except for who Jesus chooses to show him. This adds to the fact that I'm scared for people who have been shown and still don't do anything. I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure how that happened. But if you know God and you still choose to do nothing, I hope that that would change. I hope that would come to an end. The very last part I want to call the band up. Very last part, Luke 23, 24 says, Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, and you can even maybe take this as he's turned to you personally right now, and said, Blessed are the, are the eyes that seen what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings des desire to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So my last question to you guys today, is can you see? Does scripture make any sense to you at all? Because if it does, realize that that is the spirit of God in you. Because scripture itself actually says 
that the things of God are foolishness to those who are perishing. For any of you who believe in Jesus, you're not perishing. You're not those. If you can understand God's word, even a little bit, I know that a lot of it's hard. I get it. I have a hard time with it. But if you can even understand a little bit of it, that's the spirit of God in you. Can you see? This is one of those messages where you need to look introspectively into yourself, into your soul, and see where you land. Can you hear? Even Jesus says it in the word. For those that have ears to hear, let them hear. I pray in this room today, there will be open ears and open eyes. I pray in this room today that there'll be a brand new start for many of you. That life will look different because you're now looking at through the lens of the clarity of God. And the beginning of this new life that you have will be fruitful and darkness will shake because of it. I hope so. Let's all pray.